G'day Internet, Max Wright here and welcome to part five of our series, Everything You Need to Know About Bitcoin for Newbies. Now it's going to be a lot of stuff for advanced people here and this is where we really start to go into the vision of Bitcoin. We're going to talk about what the adoption curve is looking like, who's adopting Bitcoin and how that's going to play out. Remember, when you jump around all over the internet looking for clues about what Bitcoin, you end up getting 90% repetition. By watching a video series like this, you don't get any repetition, you just get all the information in the shortest amount of time possible. So the very first link in the description of this video is a playlist to the video series. I highly recommend you go back and watch it from the beginning. So let's get to it. We are now going to be talking about the adoption curve. Um, and now this is a concept that many of you are going to be familiar with, uh, but I just think it's worth rehashing and understanding it a little bit. So this is uh, known as the bell, bell curve with regard to the adoption curve. It's also known as the S curve. We'll take a look at that in just a minute. But to start off with, this is a demonstration of when people come in to the technology. So to begin with, um, the technology is usually clunky. It's kind of a pain in the butt. It's not very good to use. And people are just there because it's, they're, they're, just, they're innovators. They like tinkering with things. They like playing with things. And so even though it's clunky, even though it's annoying, they still play with the brand new technology. This is true for digital cameras. It's true for dishwashers. It's true for TVs, radios. It's true for every single technological adoption. This is the, the model of how people as a whole get involved into a new market. So to begin with, it's the innovators willing to deal with all the pains and the cost of this uh, brand new technology, right? And then later on, those innovators kind of play with it and make it a little bit cooler, make it a little bit better, and they get it to a point where the early adopters start to get in. Now, the early adopters, as you can tell, you know, they're not quite the innovators. They need some utility out of this thing. They need to um, actually get some kind of value out of it. These are the guys who, in the mobile cell phone days, you know, they, were, they carried the battery pack around them and their, their cell phone cost $3,000. But for them in their particular line of work, a cell phone was that valuable. It was worth carrying around a brick for a, a battery. And even though the, the phone cost $3,000 and there's only you know, a few thousand other people with those phones, um, it was worth it to them. But they're the early adopters. They set the marketplace. They're the people who um, now the, the big businesses can start to come in and start building the tools and at scale where the costs start to plummet and the value of the technology goes up significantly. So once the early adopters get through, and it's very important, notice these numbers, we've got two and a half percent of the population are innovators, about 13 and a half percent are known as the early adopters for any given market. And then there's what's called the chasm, or in some places it's called the tipping point, two different um, vernaculars for kind of the same thing. And this is just kind of some imaginary point on this curve where all of a sudden the technology just becomes so good, uh, so powerful, it solves so many problems, it's so easy to use, the entrepreneurs building on top of it and around it, they're, um, they've made it so easy that now all of a sudden just the hordes absolutely come in, the masses, the, the bulk of society starts to come in and just they, they separated the two um, areas, the early majority and the late majority. But really, this is one big clump. And really, this between the two of them, this is nearly 70% of the entire population comes in in this very, very short amount of time. Uh, an example might have been, you know, the um, early adopters for the innovators. These are the guys who might have, OK, we've got the Internet and now we, we, oh, we figured out that we can send email. And so the innovators are like C colon slash slash run dos run send email to and God knows what else they had to do to send an email. Uh, and probably you and I weren't going to do that. But the, the innovators, they were willing to do it. And then they got to a point where um, they could make it just a little bit easier. Um, and then maybe the chasm might have been the invention of the mouse, right? Now you've got a mouse you can click on. There's a web page and you click compose. And you go, hmm, send to bob at gmail.com, although Gmail didn't admit then, uh, uh, exist then, and type your message and use your mouse to click send. That might have been the chasm or the tipping point. And now, boom, the early majority can just flood in. And in the very, very short amount of time, 70% of the world's population jump in. All right? So that's what the adoption curve looks like from that point. It's, that's the, and you can see that the vast majority of people come in after the chasm after the tipping point. And what's good to note here is that happens at around about 16%. That's the 2.5% for the innovators, the 13.5% for the early adopters. So about 16% of the population, once they're involved, 
there's a pretty good indication that the, um, the chasm and the tipping point is here and we go through that hockey stick moment where the, just, the, just the masses come on in. So let's look at that here. It's kind of known as different names here on this thing, but this is the S curve. And so this is the same curve, but it's just cumulative rather than just how many people come in in each phase. And so you can see that eventually we're going to get to, I'm just looking at that quick math here, it's uh, I guess a 92.5%, but um, yeah, uh, 80, no, 102.5% no, it gets to. Uh, so um, that's a bit silly. But the point is this S curve is still valid. This is the cumulative um, measure of that same graph that we just saw, which is people come in and you can see around about here, this graph is saying 12.5%. Uh, but then again, this graph adds up to 102.5%. So it's, <laughs> I wouldn't put too much stock in that. But around about this point, around about that concept of 13, 14, 15, 16%, you hit this hockey stick. Um, but to be honest, this what this graph shows well is kind of this whole point feels like a hockey stick. Like way down here feels like a hockey stick. Like I was involved in Bitcoin years ago. And when the price went from a few hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars, it felt like a hockey stick. Um, and then, yeah, this whole kind of place feels like a hockey stick. It just gets steeper and steeper and steeper as the technology gets better. More things are built on top of it. Layer two is built on top of it. And all of a sudden, it just hits a critical point where there's enough social proof. It's now, it's now not, you know, your one geeky friend you hear about the new technology. Now, you know, five, 10, 15 of your friends show up with cell phones. And now you just got to have a cell phone. And it all happens very, very quick from this point known as the tipping point, right? And then all of a sudden, whoosh. Now, it's, sometimes it takes 5, 10, 15, 20 years to get to here. But once you get to that tipping point, it just takes off like a rocket in a very, very short amount of time. It just uh, gets to a nearly 90% market penetration, 80 to 90% market penetration. And then there's the holdouts, what's called the laggards who don't get in uh, for quite a while. So where are we now in this uh, life cycle. So important thing here, and I want you to take a look um, as I go through these headlines, I've just got a collection of headlines to show you, but all of these headlines, uh, you know, as recent as I could find them within the last few months, right? Um, I and mean, I think you'll get the impression that I get that it certainly feels like this hockey stick moment. We'll get to that a little bit later in the summary of this section. But the crypto population doubled to over $200 million. And the, the, the byline here is important. So it only took four months for the crypto population to almost double from 106 million in February to 203 million in May, according to a new crypto.com report. Now, uh, at that rate, doubling every four months, we are going to get to this tipping point very, very quickly. We're talking very, very short amount of years. Now, the during that that whole chart, it's not as that S curve adoption. It looks like a nice smooth chart. It's never a smooth chart. There's ebbs and flows in how many people come on board to the new product, of course. Uh, and so that that's that's important to know. Uh, I'm just gonna make sure I'm in frame here. So okay, we're getting there. So I think for that first uh, that first slide, I had to be right on the edge, but I can step into the frame a little bit more. Um, so we'll come back to here. So yeah, I just want you to know where we are. We'll use this math a little bit later, but there's now 200 million people in crypto and it's it doubled in four months. I don't expect it to double every four months from here on out, but um, I do expect it to stay at a pretty high click. We'll get to that in just a little bit. Okay, so now I'm gonna to get to who is adopting and we're gonna start with the um, finance sectors and the banking sectors. So Morgan Stanley, when was this? Uh, this was March 17 of 2021. Morgan Stanley becomes the first big US bank to offer its wealthy clients access to Bitcoin funds. Now, a little bit of background about how the, the banking system works, right? So they, these guys collect fees for managing your money. The last thing they want is for you to take your money somewhere else because there is, they're not offering a certain product that you want. So believe me, Bitcoin is a, a, a bank killer. It absolutely is. It makes banks completely redundant. This would be like swallowing nails for banks to offer a Bitcoin product. But they're in a, they have a situation. They're wealthy clients. They wanted to invest in Bitcoin. So you've got two choices, Morgan Stanley. You can either offer them a Bitcoin fund or watch them walk. You've got two options there. And you can see Morgan Stanley felt the pressure and they offered the Bitcoin funds. It did not take long. Uh, August 19th, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan launch Bitcoin funds. It goes on all of the major banks. 55% of the world's top 100 banks are investing in the crypto and blockchain space. This is kind of con like considered game theory. 
uh, meaning that you cannot be, you, you, as much as banks don't want to do this, they have no choice. The money will leave and they'll become redundant. It's like Blockbuster sitting around. You can watch the streaming video technology take hold and you can just sit there and become Blockbuster and become completely irrelevant. Or you can use your vast resources, retool and become Netflix. That's your, they're your choices. But what, if you stand still, you're losing. And for as much as I dislike like the banks, you can be sure that they've got the smartest people in the world working at the banks. That's where they go. That's where they get the most amount of money. And so they understand we have to adapt. Whether we like it or not, we are going to get put out of business. And we will do everything we can to keep money in, the, in our banking system so that we can co keep collecting those fees. So when you know, grandma or you know, your mom, your dad, your daughter, your sister, whoever, calls up the bank, and especially the high net worth clients, they're like, hey, I, I want to invest in crypto. Can you help me do it? If the answer is no, great. Put the money in my account. I'll wire it to someone who can. And this is the challenge that the banks have and game theory is playing out. So now, not only that, like it was a big hurdle to like uh, take your money out of the banking system and go and send it to like a, a crypto broker or something like that. Learn a whole crypto space. It was a headache for a lot of people. But now they're calling like JP Morgan. They're calling Wells Fargo. Hey, uh, you know, your competitor bank is doing this. Give me my money, I'm going to send it to that bank. I understand I've been dealing with banks for 20, 30, 50 years. This is not a big learning curve. I will deal with someone there instead of dealing with someone here. And so they're going to do it. And every single bank, you can see the numbers speak for themselves. Banks are just falling in line. They have no choice. So they understand the, the money, the people with the money in their banks are demanding access to invest in crypto. You can collect the, you know, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, you can collect the management fees or somebody else can. MasterCard will let merchants accept payments in crypto this year. That was from earlier in the year in February. Now, just think about that. So this is more, so I think people wanting exposure to Bitcoin funds, that's more that the first promise of Bitcoin, a store of value, right? I just want to invest in this, I want my money there. I want it to hold its value, that's a store of value. And if it happens to go up in value like Bitcoin's done very well, then even better, right? Now we're coming into MasterCard's gonna let merchants accept payments in crypto this year. Again, this is kind of tying into the Lightning Network, which we've spoken about in previous uh, sessions. All of a sudden, the second promise of Bitcoin is being revitalized big time this year and because of the Lightning Network. And just think, although I, I have no interest in spending my Bitcoin, I will never use this in a million years. Um, Gresham's law that, that, that applies here, especially in the first world. It says that good money chases out bad. Right? I have good money. It's Bitcoin. I don't want to spend it on the groceries. I don't want to do it. I want to hoard it. I want you to have my worthless fiat. Have my US dollars. I'm trying to get rid of that. I'm trying to hoard Bitcoin. But nonetheless, that's me. Other people, uh, and we've talked about it on the sessions, especially on the third world, the payment rails is about to explode. Right? There are, there are, there's a lot of people, there's over 10% of the US population who are unbanked. Right, So all of these things, these payment rails, this is the second promise of Bitcoin being fulfilled and we're getting this double kick to Bitcoin. There's the um, store of value promise and the payment rails promise both taking off big time at the same time. Let's explore this. Um, here we go. This is in the, the very end of May. First US convenience store chain to begin accepting cryptocurrency as payments. AMC, America's largest uh, movie cinema franchise, will accept Bitcoin as payment for movie tickets. Walmart is the latest Fortune 500 company hiring a cryptocurrency expert. Walmart is either the, the single largest or the second largest, I think, uh, retailer in the whole world, right? Think of every single product in a Walmart store. Think of every single Walmart store. All of a sudden, people can be using uh, their Bitcoin to buy any of those products. This is the payment rails absolutely exploding. Bitcoin comes to Whole Foods major retailer in coup for digital currency. Very important, Whole Foods is owned by Amazon, the other major um, uh, either one or two uh, retailer in the world. And Amazon is hiring a digital currency and blockchain expert, signaling a growing interest in cryptocurrencies. Now I've got an absolute slew of these. I didn't want to just like bore you with this headline after headline, but I can tell you every single bank, major financial institution, um, major retailers, major funds, major everything. They're all hiring digital currency and blockchain experts. 
They all understand where it's going. All the big money gets it. And these are the guys who are building all of that infrastructure. I used the example before on the adaption curve, right? Maybe it was the invention of the mouse that really took that um, internet experience to a whole new level where all of a sudden people didn't have to learn run, dos, run, blah, blah, blah. They click, point, it's like, ah, oh, I get this. I start to see the value of the internet. And whoosh, I don't know, is it, is it the fact that you can buy um, everything on Amazon with, uh, with Bitcoin? Is that what it is? I don't know. Is that the tipping point? I don't know. Is it that I get, uh, all, you know, the banks all of a sudden are offering Bitcoin funds? I don't know. But with everybody hiring cryptocurrency experts, experts building new products, building new infrastructure, that moment where it just becomes absolutely dead easy for the, the majority, the early majority and the late majority, that is imminent. It is very, very close to us. Is Apple about to accept cryptocurrency? Job ad suggests it might. Apple, huh? What happens if when you buy your iPhone, there's a Bitcoin wallet, Lightning wallet built right into it? Highly secure. They've actually got the physical, um, the, the hardware of the Apple phone becomes a very, very secure wallet. So your, your Bitcoins are less online because they're on your phone. Very, very powerful. Maybe that's it. That was reported in May of this year. And here's a big one. Jack Dorsey is a huge, huge, huge proponent of Bitcoin. He's been at many Bitcoin events. Uh, I saw him at the most recent uh, uh, Miami Bitcoin event. And um, he is building, so someone suggested streaming sats. Build LN, that means Lightning Network, build Lightning Network into Blue Sky or Twitter, please and thank you. To which Jack Torsey, CEO of Twitter and uh, Blue Sky, uh, Blue Sky is the um, open source version of Twitter, uh, says he says only a matter of time, and even since then he's had some other tweets um, saying that it's. I mean, it's just it's jobs on. Like, it's it'll be uh, within. I would suggest within months that every Twitter account will be a Bitcoin account, right? Every Twitter account will be a Bitcoin wallet. And the, there's something here. I'm going to teach you a little language here. Streaming Sats. Sats is a nickname for Satoshi. You remember that Bitcoin was invented by a pseudo anonymous inventor called Satoshi Nakamoto. What, as a tribute to Satoshi, um, you know, in, the, in the, the fiat world, we have dollars and cents. As a tribute to, Sato to Satoshi, uh, Bitcoin is, there's the Bitcoin unit, but the cents portion, fractions of Bitcoin, are called Satoshis. The smallest fraction, I believe, what is it? It's one one millionth? I think it's, no, it's maybe it's one one hundred millionth. One one hundred millionth of a Bitcoin is called a Satoshi. And thanks to Lightning Network, something that has never been able to be done before, has can now be done with Mastercard and Visa and all other pre-existing payment rails. Um, it, it wasn't cost effective. You couldn't subscribe to Netflix for a dollar a day. It had to be fifteen dollars a month. Because why? Because the merchant fees are high. It costs thirty cents. You know, regardless of the amount, it costs thirty cents to do a transaction with Mastercard and Visa. All right. With the Lightning Network, fractions of pennies can be paid for things. Now, what does that mean? Let's say you're watching a YouTube stream. You're watching this video and you want to tip me. You're enjoying it and you just click the button that says, start tipping this guy for as much as I watch him. And you could send me a penny per minute or per second or a fraction of a penny per second for every video you watch of mine. And that money just streams into my wallet. There is no cost. It streams fractions of pennies. This is going to op open up whole new business models that the world has never seen. I'll tell you a massive, massive, massive problem that the world has, and we've never really had a solution for it behind now, is spam. We have spam in Facebook, we have spam in Twitter, we have spam in emails, and there are just billions of dollars spent trying to solve the spam problem. There's a very, very, very easy solution to the spam problem that we've never had access to before. What if at the beginning of the year, you put in your Gmail account on your email account, you put in $5 worth of Bitcoin, just $5. And every single time you send an email, you just say that you're willing to pay a fraction of a penny, just a fraction of a penny. $5 will last you the whole year. Every single one of your emails, you pay a fraction of a penny. But what that means is to you who sends one email, uh, you know, you know, to one person or maybe a little bit more, you, you know, you're gonna be able to spend $5 to make sure my email gets through, doesn't get trapped in a spam filter. I'm willing to pay that. To the spammer who literally has to spend, send out a, you know, 10 million emails in the hopes that one foolish person clicks on them, for that person, it is no longer um, an option for them to pay a fraction of a penny 
per email. This is true for Facebook posts. It's true for Twitter posts. It's true for YouTube videos. It's true for your email. Spam is a monster, monster problem in the world. And there's a potential that all spam is gonna completely disappear and you're gonna become a paper, a paper um, post user on social media, on your emails. It's gonna cost you nothing. You don't even think about it. It'd be $5 a year. But it's enough to knock out the spammers. And all of a sudden, this billion dollar industry of like, weeding through spams and the time wasted uh, of us trying to get rid of spam out of our lives, all of a sudden that just disappears with a much, much, much more efficient. That's just one new application of what's happening with Lightning Network and, the, and, the, and Bitcoin. Who knows what else can happen? No one knows. It's, it's, just, it's absolutely incredible what the potentials are. And finally, um, I, thought that, I really thought this would be about five or 10 years away. I cannot believe that this happened. In five days from now, by the time you watch this video, it will have already happened. Um, El Salvador, that is the country, a nation state, has made Bitcoin legal tender in their country. This has been monstrous news. So they actually voted on it a month ago. By the time, it'll actually be implemented five days from now. By the time you watch it, it will already be implemented. And part of the thing, El Salvador is going to buy uh, and give every single citizen $10 worth of Bitcoin. Um, they're setting up Bitcoin ATMs all over the country. Now, why are they doing this? I wanna, I wanna share with you the power of this. So El, El Salvador, El Salvador um, I believe it's something in the order of 30%. 30% of their GDP is remittance. 30% of every dollar that comes into the country comes just from someone working in the, in the first world and sending money back to their family and friends so they can survive, right? The problem is going through Western Union and doing it through existing payment rails. Yeah, Western Union in El Salvador, they take about a 20 to 30% fee. And it's an extremely dangerous thing. You got to, people have to catch a bus for like two hours to go to a Western Union store and there's gangs waiting out for them to walk out of the store and mug them and take their money that they got. This with Bitnik Bitcoin Lightning Network, completely free. The money goes straight to the person's phone. They never leave their couch. And El Salvador has just mandated that every single merchant in the country accept Bitcoin for their products and services, right? This is a game changer. I knew it would happen. I just thought we were about five or 10 years away from it. The fact this has already happened, I cannot tell you is absolutely mind blowing. Just, I can't believe it's happened this fast. So, um, where am I? Let me get back in the, in the shot here. So um, yeah, the adoption is just absolutely surging right across the board. Anybody who is anybody is getting involved in Bitcoin. Major companies, major banking institution, major retailers, anywhere where money is handed over from one person to another. The bigger companies who can afford to pay the big salaries and, and hire these people to figure it all out, they're doing it. And we are getting closer and closer to the tipping point, to the chasm where the mouse is invented and all of a sudden, your, your Bitcoin wallet is on every single phone, every single retailer accepts it, and what we call hyper-Bitcoinization. Just the whole world just moves to Bitcoin. And we are very, very close. So current projections, let me go back, I, I put this uh, slide back in at the end of this uh, little presentation here. So yeah, um, I just wanna show you, I'm just gonna share how on track this is to begin with. Um, this bell curve, it's existed throughout like all of time, like from the innovation of the radio, like how long did it take to get the radio into 100% of households? You know, it follows this, this curve, but it was very, very long. It took something like 70 years or something for the radio to get in. Over the time, it gets shorter. It took something like TV, it took something TV about 40 years to get into 80% of households from the moment it was invented, right? Something like the microwave, I think it took like about 30 years. Something like the cell phone took about 20 years to get 80% market penetration, right? Uh, Bitcoin is on track. It is uh, further ahead. So it is, it is about where um, the internet was in 1997 and it's growing much, much faster as you would expect. It's bell curve here is it's squeezing up closer and closer. The time is narrow because the technology exists to get the word out quickly. You make one video, you put it on YouTube and all of a sudden people all over the world can hear about it. So the speed of this um, S curve and this adoption curve is growing rapidly. And so as you would expect, you would expect Bitcoin to be growing faster than the internet grew. And that's exactly what happened. So let's do some quick math here. We've got about, let's call it 8 billion people on the planet, right? 
And according to this, the chasm or the tipping point usually occurs around 16% uh, of the when the population has adopted it. 16%. Now, 16% of the population, um, of the current population, worldwide population, is a little bit over one. It's like 1.2 billion people, all right? You saw the news article earlier that crypto worldwide adoption is currently at 200 million people. And it's doubled in the last four months, right? I don't think it'll stick. I think it'll slow down a little bit, right? But if by those projections, you can just count it out on your fingers. Like if there's 200 million now, let's go forward another four months by October. Um, we're at 400 million. February 22, we're at 800 million. Middle of 2022, let's call it June 2022, we should be at 1.4 billion, all right? I think it will slow down a little bit, but it might not, right? Let's, but let's just say 2023, right? Can we just do that? In 2023, there's going to be over a billion Bitcoin users. I think that's a safe lock, all right? Uh, Bitcoin crypto users by 2023. Okay, what the, what the S-curve shares with us, what it teaches us, by about 2027, 2028, it's going to be at 3 billion users. All right. The, the, what's, what's about to happen, people can't even fathom. As human beings, we just we think in linear terms. Exponential things are just very, very hard. You have to really train your brain to get there to think about it. Um, it's kind of like that, the old, uh, that, uh, old, old sort of a quiz you could kind of give youngsters. It's like if, um, if you'd put a, a drop of water in a, in a football stadium and you'd add... Um, you double the amount you add every single time, right? How long does it take to fill up? And how full is it, you know, the, how, how many days before it's completely full, is it half full? And the answer is it's just one day because it doubles every time, right? And this exponential thing is kind of, this, this question kind of breaks our mind because we are trained, uh, we live in a linear world generally, and we, our brains understand linear things. It takes a lot of practice to understand and fathom exponential growth. You know who figured out exponential growth? Investors in Facebook, investors in Amazon, investors in Google, investors in Apple. They figured out exponential growth. They trained their brains to figure out exponential growth. They saw these adaption curves just come in, start to go up, hit a st hockey stick and go vertical. And we are so, so close to that time. All right, guys, that is it for this presentation. Please, now tomorrow at 10 a.m. Central Time, I'm gonna be releasing the next one. Now, it's, this is gonna be a brand new section. For all the years I've been talking about Bitcoin, I've never had a section in there about environmental headwinds or tailwinds. The courtesy of Elon Musk, that's become a thing. I'm gonna go ahead and talk about that in the very next video. So make sure you tune in tomorrow at 10 a.m. Central. If not, um, remember the playlist is on the, the first link in the description. Make sure you click on that playlist and get all of the information very sequentially, nice and easy, no repetition. Within about 90 minutes, you are gonna become one of the most knowledgeable people on Bitcoin in the world. That's, I mean, it's, it's, it's that good with no repetition. So go ahead and do that. So please subscribe to the channel. That, that way YouTube will let you know when we're gonna be on tomorrow. And I do other videos all the time. Please make sure you like this video and comment. What did you learn? What did you learn in this video? Were you shocked by the numbers? Do you think we're gonna hit um, a, a billion users by the year 2023? Can you fathom hitting 3 billion users by 2028? Do you think that's going to happen? Or is this uh, modeling absolutely nonsense? Is there something I've missed? Let me know in the comments below. And I'll see you guys tomorrow at uh, when? 10, 10 a.m. Central. Thanks. Bye.